last lecture I discussed cosets, but for some reason I always exchange the definition of left and right coset, but so the, but the one should stick to standard conven conventions. So, the left coset, so H is some subgroup of G as I defined. So, left coset is defined by the equal uh, equivalence relation where you say two elements G 1 and G 2 are equivalent to each other if G 1 is G 2 times some element of H. Okay. While the right coset is again an equivalence relation, but So, as we discussed each both of them give ri rise to <coughs> partitions uh, uh, of the set G. Uh, so, that goes through, but in general uh, left coset need not be equal to a right coset. Okay. And uh, so, nice example to play with is uh, take the example of uh, uh, Z 4. So, so let us take that to be given by the set of uh, the following four elements 0, 1, 2, 3 the set. So, G is this and the operation is just addition mod 4 just giving you a realization and let H be the subgroup. with elements 0 and 4. I leave it as an ex exercise for you to rather than example actually what I mean is I want you to work out okay. and uh, in this instance you will see that left coset and right coset will be equal equivalent to each other we will see why, but meanwhile what I want to do is to introduce you. to one of the most important uh, finite groups called the permutation group. Okay. Actually the permutation group is not one group, it is a family of groups and they will call it S n okay. and this n indicates that it is the permutation in n objects. Okay. So, I will describe it through a C, uh, through its operations rather than uh, give you a, giving you a list of elements and uh, an order of S n will be n factorial, it is a number of permutations. Okay. So, let us just take a speak a specific example here. of S 3 okay, and we will. So, it should be acting on something. So, we what we will with three objects. So, we will just say that let us say that we think of permutations of of three of three elements which we will call 1, 2 and 3. Okay. So, what we will do is so an element of of S 3 I will write in a is given by something like for instance say 1 goes to say 2, 2 goes to 1 and 3 is invariant. So, this operation you can see is uh, is just the exchange of 1 and 2. Okay, so, let us just call this element, we will call it G 1. Let us write another element, let us call it G 2 and this time I am going to choose something where 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 1. This is what is called a cyclic permutation. Okay. 
So now let us uh, see how this group is and let us do the composition. of these two elements okay and the this way of writing things is very makes life uh, easy in the following sense i can do the composition by just tracking things so 1 goes to 2 and then i come here 2 goes to 3 so 1 goes to 3 okay next 2 goes to 1 then come follow it up 1 goes to 2. So, I started with 2 and ended up with 2 and then 3 goes to 3 here, but 3 goes to 1. We can do the other order as well. one goes to two here and two goes to one. So, two goes to three and three goes to three and then okay. it is non abelian g 2 dot g 1 is not equal to g 1 dot g 2. Okay. And what is the identity? Should do nothing, one should go to one, two, two should go to two, three should go to So, you can I will not explicitly write out all the six elements I have written most of them I think in the out here I written 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 there is only one missing I guess. Okay. So, I leave it to you to figure out what that is, but uh, now comes the nice stuff uh, we can ask uh, what about uh, uh, <coughs> subgroups of this of S 3. Okay. So, obvious subgroups are uh, see so you take an element like this it is 1 2 exchange and uh, uh, so it is uh, so if you operate it 2 times it does nothing. Okay. So, we will call this sort of an operation we will call this an elementary exchange. Okay. So, I just before even I get on to this now you can see that it is very easy to generalize it to arbitrary S n you just take a set with n elements and then you write out all possible permutations in this fashion. Some if you get very bored with writing it in these things you just write the denominator part because the thing comes for the right. There are other ways of uh, writing out per elements of the permutation group, but we will not do that. Okay. But there is a nice uh, first thing is that uh, I will give a claim. I will make a very simple claim. The claim is that S3 is isomorphic to the group, the dihedral group at D6. Okay. So, I leave it as an exercise for you to prove it. There are many, many ways of proving it. One way is uh, the horrible way is to go ahead, write out the full group uh, group multiplications and write out a map from this thing to the other. Okay. But this is, but there are other ways of doing it as well. But in general, let us look at S n. Uh, if you take S n, uh, <coughs> I uh, will make a claim here again, or you can say it is a theorem. Uh, the group S n is generated by n minus 1 elementary exchanges. Okay, so, let me show you what I mean by that, what I mean by an elementary exchange is so 1, 2 up to n, so 2, 1 this is, so 3 goes to 3 all the others are identical. So, this is the first elementary exchange where I exchange 1 and 2 alone, the second exchange will exchange 2 and 3 and it is just an elementary exchange, but involving only neighboring elements and that is it there are n minus 1 of them. Okay. Coming back to this example there are exactly 2, so I can, uh, so this is one element the other element would be the 2 3 exchange which we have somewhere here this element I claim that these two elements are sufficient to generate the whole group. 
Okay, so here the next one would be 1, 2, 1 goes to 1, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 2 and 4 goes to 4 of course. You can rewrite write out n minus 1 element. So, this is uh, intuitively you can see this, but in general you can work this out. Okay. Now, so uh, assuming this claim is true, what this tells you is that any group element by group I mean a group element can be written as a product of these by products of these n minus 1 elements. Okay. Now, the thing is that we will call a permutation an element a permutation element even if it is made up by composing uh, even number of these guys. Okay. So, a permutation is even if it can be written as a product of even number of elementary exchanges. Okay, they, this way of writing it's not, it doesn't mean there's a unique way of writing. You could, you know, write a whole by different ways of writing it. But uh, what will not change is the fact that uh, you can never convert something which is an even permutation to an odd one. The other ones are odd, obviously. Okay, and so let's see. Uh, uh, so an example of uh, an odd permutation is, of course, the elementary operation. They involve only one. But you take this G two. Now this can be obtained. Uh, this is an uh, this is an example of an even permutation, and the way to see that is that uh, the way you can do this is to first you take one two exchange you get this, and then follow it up with a two three the second and third exchange then you will come to this, so it's an even permutation. Now comes the nice part. the set of even permutations is a subgroup of order subgroup of S n. What will be its order? Be half of half of the half of n factorial. Okay. Okay, and this group has a name. We just call it A n. Okay. So, are there any questions so far? Because we have been just de defining things. Now we will uh, we'll see in many ways that uh, uh, the, uh, every group, any finite group, can be embedded into the permutation group. So this is a very nice thing, and it gives you a very what is called a permutation representation of the group. So, so here is a nice theorem. Any group, any finite group. G can be written can be yeah, written I don't know the bad bad English but okay written as a subgroup 
of the permutation group group for some n. We will fix the value of n in a moment, but uh, okay. So, what this theorem implies is that in some sense uh, all groups, all finite groups are actually, so if you can study subgroups of S n for arbitrary n, they are subgroups of, I mean then you would see all the groups. Okay. But this is only, uh, this has some nice, uh, this has some nice properties, but uh, I do not think it will let you search for all the groups in some ways. Okay. Okay. So, how would one do this? So, like I said, you need to start with something which uh, uh, you should. Uh, the permutation group acts on uh, on a set of n or uh, set of n objects. So I'll give you the set. Okay, so consider the set. G. And let's say that. G S capital N elements. So, now what I need to do is to for now we need to give a map map from G to S and now I will make it precise to S n where n is the order of the group okay, for every element. Okay, this I, I, that follows. Okay, so so what the way you do this is let, uh, let pick an element G, and let it act on. Consider the following object. Okay, what does it do? It takes okay. So now what is happening out here is g is acting on g1 it will give you because it's a it's it's an element of the same group it will give you another group element similarly you can you will generate all the other group elements you can convince yourself that it has to be only a permutation of this group okay so now i will write out the permutation so it would be so so let's uh, let's let me just uh, use some notation out here let's say that this will call g of p1 we will call this g of p 2 ok. So, for for this uh, for this particular element we got this, this thing. So, what we get now is a nice association 1 2 Okay, now you need to check that it, uh, it 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 is consistent with the composition of the group. But you can go back to the original definition, and you take two elements, and you will see that the answer will work out. So I leave that as an exercise. Okay, so there's another way of uh, writing these. You could write this. You can think of one, two, three to n. So you can also write this as an n by n matrix, which is the following, which. So <coughs> yeah so what is it this sum okay now this this will be some matrix which will have only ones and zeros in its entries it's a very simple matrix because one goes to p 1. So, you go to the first row wherever at the p 1th element you put 1 the rest of the first row would be 0, second row would have only the p 2th element equal to 1, third row would be this way that way you will see that you get a nice matrix. Okay. So, this so this is called, so now the, this fits in with what we had earlier if you remember we said that if you give me any matrix which, uh, which satisfies the group multiplication row that is like a representation. 
So, this has a name this is called the permutation representation. Okay. So, if you yeah it is a group yeah, but uh, I am thinking of the yeah it is also a set it is also a group. So, so this is the uh, this is a set on which G is acting. So, uh, it has a dual role absolutely right it has uh, right now this uh, here this is just a set of n elements with some ordering it does not matter what ordering you choose you choose some order and leave it at that. So, here I am just thinking of it as a set with elements written in some order. But of course, when I come to this part, I am doing the composition within the group. Okay, is this clear? Are there any other questions? It's a very good question. So let's take S three, which is already a permutation group, but uh, uh, so but for it uh, the order is six. So this process will uh, will give you an embedding or a representation of S three in terms of six by six matrices which is much larger than in fact uh, much larger than 3 okay so obviously it, uh, if you are given a group this method of writing it won't give you the largest uh, will not give you the the it will not give you the sort of the minimal embedding into s whatever is the group but it will give you some it will give you something but this uh, this uh, this particular representation has lots of nice properties which one would do in any course on finite groups, but this is not such a course. This is just to show you that these objects exist, and uh, and there's also if going back to the full set of permutation groups. What you have is the s s three is a sub uh, has a subgroup which is s two. It's a it's a subgroup which preserves one element, subgroup of permutations which preserves one element, and of course if you start this way there are three different ways of uh, there are three different S twos that you could get. This way. <coughs> Similarly, out here if you start from here there are four different S threes you could get out here. Okay. Similarly, S four you can get five different ways. S six so on so forth. There's an infinite sequence. S six has uh, a slightly different property which I will not uh, uh, which leads to some very nice constructions, but uh, uh, but from this viewpoint it is just that out here there are just 5 s 5s you could get into this, but it turns out there are 5 others which you cannot see in this manner it is called an outer automorphism it has an outer automorphism. Yeah. Okay. So, this is like a full sequence which you have and you can see that any group can sit inside this. So, now the point here is to ask uh, get, uh, uh, questions about subgroups, and so there is a nice idea called the normal subgroup, which is related to the st uh, the coset. This state this can be obtained as as follows: when is a coset a group? Okay, and the answer is uh, uh, it is a group when the subgroup which you are quotienting by is a normal subgroup. So we have to do, we have to it's like chicken and egg. We need to figure out. Uh, I mean, choose one of them and work it out. So we will ask this question, and that will tell us the answer to the definition of this. So let us uh, let me remind you of this definition. So let's stick to left cosets. So G, this symbol is the equivalence class. of all elements which you can write as g h okay it a, has a, a set of h elements when g is equal to e so you could choose any representative from this set uh, from this and put it out here so it represents any of those things okay so a generic element of this would be something g times little so the question is suppose you are given two different elements g 
1 and the question is does this sort of can I make something like this work. Okay. And I do not want to introduce any fancy new compositional rule, I want to ask if there is a composition rule which is induced from the bigger group into which it sits. So, a generic element here would be writable as say g 1 dot h 1, a generic element here could be written as g 2 dot h 2 and let us just write this one would be g 1 g 2 with some h 3. Okay. So, so now you can see here is that what you want really is if g 2 need not uh, g, g 2 need not commute with h 2, what you need is something very weak, what you need is g 2 what you need that g uh, let us say that h 1 dot g 2 is equal to some h prime. Okay. Then, you can where h prime is of course, an element in h. So, again we will stick to this notation. Okay. So, if this is true, this will follow okay. and this should hold for all g I mean this is not enough for it to hold for one particular uh, equivalence uh, element uh, equivalence class it should hold for all equivalence classes okay now within an equivalence class it shouldn't matter which element you choose exactly but uh, you have to show true for all equivalence classes yes so you can see out here this is the what we uh, this is the kind of thing which we would have used uh, which we used in the definition of the left coset while this is for the right coset. So, roughly it tells you intuitively left coset should be equal to right coset this should be true for all g 2 is this clear. Okay. So, so the condition can be written as follows. So, um, so, let me box this out. So, we need okay. then we get a group. then we get a, a group action on the coset which we can write as follows. This is one thing which follows and of course, left coset and right coset are the same. Okay. First thing to note is that if g is abelian, okay, then there is nothing the everything goes through, okay, there is nothing to check. Okay, so, so, now we can see that corollary or whatever all subgroups of abelian groups are normal. Okay, so, the definition here is that if H is such a subgroup then okay, it satisfies that property we call it a normal subgroup. Okay. Then the 
that means G2 would be in the universe will be in the equivalence class of the identity. Yeah. Suppose what you are saying is suppose H1 dot G2 is H prime, huh? then this implies that uh, G is uh, also an element of of uh, of H G2. So this just implies that equivalence class of E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one particular equivalence class, but that's only one set of elements. It's always true for that. Trivially true for that such elements, but it's not true for elements which are not in that universal in that equivalence class. Okay. So now comes the question: Can we find out all, all, uh, all finite groups? And you want to sort of you can see that if if there is a group which, which has a, a normal subgroup, then you can quotient it and in some sense it, it comes from another group. So, example of this is uh, the, uh, the one we looked earlier which was to take uh, Z 4 which is an abelian group it has a Z 2 which is uh, which is a subgroup obviously Z 4 cross Z 2 is, uh, is, uh, is also a group okay. and because it is a two element group there is only one two element group it is also a Z 2, but the most interesting thing is that Z 4 is not Z 2 cross Z 2. Okay. These again it is an exercise for you to check that these two groups are different okay. and uh, so actually so what it tells you is that if you give me two Z 2s there is this direct product, but there is also a sort of much more complicated way of doing it which should give you Z 4. Okay. So, these are called semi direct products which we are not going to discuss, but there is a so, but at the end of the day you can see that uh, by getting uh, looking at Z 4, we, we can in some uh, it is enough for us to look at Z Z 2s, we are more or less we will get we can construct it by taking two copies and doing something to it. So, the idea is to look for groups which cannot be broken down in some ways into smaller guys, they should not have normal subgroups, those groups are called simple groups. Okay. As a group is said to be simple if it has no normal subgroups yes oh, i mean then you yeah in principle you can take any group of elements you can define anything but uh, the precise statement is that it's not natural okay you are introducing some other thing that way you can give me any set you can take and you can put uh, if you uh, i mean you take a, this is only a set i can give any operation random operation and that will give you a group, but that is not in some sense yeah mathematicians call it natural it is not natural it should come in a this way this is natural I did not have to create any new structure. Okay. So, a simple group is one that has no normal subgroups. And uh, <coughs> so, the idea in looking at this is in some sense these are the simplest objects uh, you cannot deconstruct it into something uh, into smaller parts that is what it means. Okay. So, the question is uh, so let us look for examples of these guys. Okay. So, examples the first one is the following Z p where p is prime it does not have any non trivial subgroups. So, it is true if p, p is not a composite obviously it is like Z 4. Okay. Uh, second one is A n. So, this is the alternating group, which is uh, I did not give the name, I guess, A for alternating. It is called the alternating group, it is a set uh, subset of even permutations for 
n equal to 4 is not. So, I think it is n greater than or equal to 5, okay. they are all simple. So, if you take S n, S n is not simple, you remove this z 2 which is uh, this thing and you quotient it and you get uh, you get a this thing. So, you can think of S n sorry A n to be and this is an easy way to see that uh, the dimension of A n should be half n factorial. Okay. Now, come there is a much more complicated set which uh, which are associated with uh, what we will call Lie groups. I will explain these terms Lie groups with uh, value with uh, Lie groups with uh, elements in the finite fields. I would not explain this in uh, gory detail. So, we will just take uh, uh, just consider uh, for instance the S O n matrices and uh, these were n by n matrices which were orthogonal and the elements were supposed to be real, but I could have chosen a different field. I could have put a complex number also and keep the same definition that will still hold. You will get a larger set of solutions, but what you do now is to choose instead of R and C choose some finite field. With a, okay. So, what is a finite field? An example of uh, a finite field is if you do uh, mod p, where p is some prime arithmetic. So, that is only so the number of elements would be 0 to p minus 1, because anything uh, so, so mod, so it is called z p, I do not know, I should call it mod p addition, p is a prime. So, a field is something which has uh, two operations uh, plus and uh, product. So, these are all the same things and the important thing is that there should be an inverse uh, for even multiplication okay. and uh, that is where the prime condition comes. You can go back and play with it and see if p is not prime it gets violated. So, that is an example of a finite field. So, the key point is that there are only a finite number of elements. So, if you look at let us say you take uh, uh, mod 3 addition, it is like looking at uh, n by n matrices with uh, whose uh, uh, elements are only 0, 1 and 2, because uh, 3 is equivalent to 0 in mod. Okay. So, you get only 3 n square elements even before imposing the orthogonality condition. So, it is only a, so you end up getting finite groups. So, what was actually in our case, uh, we started off with uh, S O n r, which would be a uh, infinite dimensional group from this viewpoint because it's, it has an infinite number of elements once you put in uh, finite elements. So, from that set you get a whole thing. So, the so these are the so this is a sort of examples which we understand okay. and uh, the question is are there more and um, the answer is yes there are 26 more the fourth one I will write here. groups and they are called sporadic groups. In the 1800s around that time Matthew had constructed 5 examples. So, examples of them are something called the Matthew groups, these were known for a while. So, there were 5 of them. the symbols they mean something, but uh, here the one thing you can think of it as follows these 12, 22 etcetera indicate that there they, they are some subgroups of uh, the corresponding S. So, M 24 is a subgroup of S 24 for instance, okay. but uh, this was uh, and people did not know too many examples and they thought maybe this was it and the, there was a classification on on uh, classifying all simple groups and uh, so this was uh, this involved lots of people thousands and thousands of pa pages of uh, uh, calculations etc and uh, they found uh, in the process they found several more examples and the largest uh, of this 26 is uh, is called the monster it was found by fisher i guess and grice 
called the monster group. It has about 10 power 53 elements. Okay. I do not know, it is something like the number of uh, atoms or whatever in Jupiter or something like that, it is that big. But the amazing thing is that the classification actually found these things. So, and uh, I, 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 there is actually a beautiful book by, forgotten the name, by Mark Ronan. You can check it on Amazon or something like that, where he actually discusses the history of how people found these groups, etcetera. Actually, it was a period of 10 years, I think 1960s to 1970s, where actually all these things were found. These various groups were found in bits and pieces by different people. And the, and the convention usually is to name it after the person who found the group. Okay. So, there is something called Conway, uh, called CO1, CO2, so on and so forth. Then there is the Yanko groups. Yanko found them, etcetera. So, but there are only 26 of them, and uh, so there. Uh, I think Jeff Mason or somebody had given a proof which had a gap, and it got filled only in the year 2004. The uh, something called the quasi thin case it got completed. So, in around 2004, a couple of people I think uh, proved that uh, they filled the last gap, and uh, so now it is generally accepted that this is it, these are the only groups the ones which I have written. These I have, this I have been a little bit loose, but uh, Wikipedia has a nice entry where they write out in more detail what these various groups are. These two are easy to state, but the amazing thing is that is all, there is no more. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the key point here is 10 to the power of 53 is large, but at the end of the day it is still a finite number. So, it is still a finite group. Okay. So, and uh, now people are in the process of uh, trying to write what is called the second generation proof of, uh, of the classification. So, that uh, because it was done in bits and pieces and apparently, so far now 6 volumes have been written and there are still it is still going on, but for us we believe this and it is sort of an exercise amazing exercise done by, uh, uh, by mathematicians groups of mathematicians. So, this is all I have to say about finite groups, but I should point out that finite groups will come I mean, we, uh, even in physics, there will be situations where you would come across finite groups. For instance, if you are looking at uh, uh, finite or at least discrete groups, uh, so if you take uh, uh, if you take a crystal, crystal for instance, uh, so there uh, on a, in a crystal, your translation is broken to just lattice steps. Okay, so in a crystal. Uh, set of lattice translations form a group and uh, of course, if you look at point symmetries, if you pick fix a point and then you start looking at it, you get things like the dihedral group. So, you get things like dihedral, trihedral group. Exactly 29 groups, is it? 26. Oh, you said 26 more plus those 3. Yeah. Is it? No, but these are 3 families. These are families. Oh. So, this is like in, uh, in fact, now uh, you can see that if I take uh, if I take a prime number which is larger, I mean larger than 10 power 53, of course, there exists a prime number greater than 10 power 53. That group has more elements than this, but it has much less structure than such a group. So, I mean. A n of course, you can see it is not very hard to if you take n, it grows like factorial. So, it Stirling's formula will tell you that it will go very fast. Okay. I do not even know 100 itself might exceed it. Yeah. But uh, does it mean that you can construct any other group as a composition of these or? So, yeah the point here is that now any group, any all the finite groups that you would look at could be obtained from uh, from these groups. In some ways. Okay, so, these are the irreducible parts, I mean these cannot be broken down into this. Okay. So, again, uh, so for instance, there are of these 26 groups, some of them are actually subgroups of the monster okay. and there are I think a few which are uh, not subgroups of the monster, they are called the they are called pariahs. Okay. I mean in India, since we are in India, we do not need to explain the meaning of the word pariah, we know what that means. Okay. So, they are the outliers. 
So, so we do come across uh, symmetries like this, but even even when we look at continuous symmetries, we saw we saw for instance when we looked at the orthogonal group, there was a z2 which came out, which was like parity. Okay, and what we will see later is that if you when we are looking at what are called Lie groups. Such as you know S U N, O N. Uh, these are just examples. Okay, you can look at what is called their while group. They they have something called a while group. For instance, I, the reason I chose S U N is because its while group is S N. Okay, so these these discrete groups come come in disguise. They do they do come. In, quite, uh, in, in many applications in physics and by and large one thinks or at least so I thought that one would never use uh, none of these sporadic groups would appear anywhere, but it turns out in a weird way the monster group made an appearance in something called moonshine. So, it is called monstrous moonshine. So, uh, uh, mathematicians are very specialized people, they each person does their own thing and they are experts in that and they do not quite often look at things which are in other areas, but they do and when they do interesting things happen. So, there was a mathematician who was looking at uh, there is some j this, this function called the j function uh, in uh, this is a modular form. So, this is a bunch of people who do look at modular forms, but uh, why would a guy looking at who does group theory look at this. In general, there was no reason to look at it. So, this has a expansion. So, q there is a Fourier expansion. So, q is some e power i pi tau. There is some expansion which is 1 over q plus some constant plus uh, then came the number. I do not even remember the number now, some 17884 or something like that. I am not sure q plus so on and so forth. And, uh, this number he looked at it and this uh, uh, look uh, this the smallest matrix representation of this monster group was exactly one less than this number. Then he looked at the next term as well okay, and uh, that also broke up into two representation uh, broke up into the representations of the monster. So, uh, out of the blue I mean this is some vague function in some other part of uh, of uh, of mathematics and this is in group theory and uh, the qu question is how are these two related and the amazing story is that the yes they get related in a very beautiful way and in fact this whole series every term in that has something to do with the monster group and uh, so this so this was an observation due to mckay and uh, who sent his observation to one of these very important names in the classification of finite groups Thomson and Thomson actually verified that it actually worked a little bit more and uh, so this led to a beautiful uh, uh, construction, but now comes the neat stuff that uh, this actually this function also appears in string theory. So, it is the partition function, so this is the partition function or the what is called the chiral partition function of the bosonic string. compactified on some lattice. Some 24 dimensional lattice called the Leach lattice. So, it actually came, so one would think that there is nothing, uh, why would a physics person do it, but a physics person doing string theory actually would see this come in a very interesting way. And in fact, this, uh, this observation led to the uh, proof of what I call the, uh, the monstrous moonshine conjecture is now it is no longer the conjecture and it is a beautiful story which has an interplay of physics and mathematics actually. <laughs>